Welcome to the Designing Hollywood podcast in association with The John Campia Show. I am your host, Robert Meyer Burnett. Today's episode is sponsored by International Silks and Woolens. today is an Emmy Award-winning and CDGA-nominated costume designer. She completed formal training in fashion and costume design in her native Britain and has gone on to design feature films, television, ballet, and theater. Most recently, she designed HBO's Perry Mason Season 2 and The Sterling Affairs for FX and Disney Plus's The Mysterious Benedict Society, for which she won an Emmy. Additional credits include Amazon Prime's The Man in the High Castle Seasons 3 and 4, The Sun Season 1, a western for AMC set in 1849 and 1915, and of course ABC's iconic Desperate Housewives. From my perspective, she also did four Alien Nation TV movies for Kenneth Johnson, which I think is pretty badass. She's a passionate storyteller building entire worlds through the clothes and has completed projects in Vancouver, Dublin, Rome, Nice, Monte Carlo, as well as multiple cities across the U.S. When not on location, she calls Los Angeles home. She's had an Emmy for Outstanding Costume Design, Children and Families Emmys for the Mysterious Benedict Society, Costume Designers Guild nominations, Excellence in Period Television for The Man in the High Castle, Outstanding Contemporary Television for Desperate Housewives in 2005, 2006, 2007, and nominations for Outstanding Costume Design for the Primetime Emmys for Desperate Housewives 2005, 2006, 2007, and 2008. Without further ado, please welcome award-winning costume designer Catherine Adair, or Kate, to the Designing Hollywood Show. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm sorry, I had to I had to throw in the uh, the alienation in there because as no, we were saying, <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm a huge fan, and as I was telling you before we started, that. Um, that's a, a favorite. The series was a favorite of mine and the TV movies, you know, normally sometimes series go away and you don't see them again, but those TV movies were terrific and they don't get nearly the credit they deserve. So thank you for the work that you did on that, on oh, those well, movies. My now, pleasure. 
Oh, there. The other funny thing, actually, is that um, there is this resurgence with some pieces from the uh, from the nineties, and there's also a new fascination with just as an, another aside um, with horror movies from the nineteen nineties. And oh, I yeah. also designed. Uh, I know what you did last summer. Yes, um, uh, which which by the way, uh, a classic. That's Kevin Kevin Williamson. Yep. Um, and uh, again, the cast, iconic cast, iconic film. Yeah. And I think they're didn't they remake that or they're bringing that back again? They did. They did a sec. They did a sequel. Um, I did the I I did the first one with Jim Gillespie, who is an extraordinary director, and it I did indeed have a wonderful cast. Um, they did a sequel, which I didn't do. And then I think there was a short-lived television series, but I don't right. really know much about that. And moving on. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I always ask, I always like to start with, was it something, was costume design uh, a calling for you? Was it something that you always wanted to do? And how did you get into it? Did you have a strong academic background? What led you into the profession? That, you, that's um, a great question because there's so many different ways we come, all of us as a community come into it. Um, I always loved making things and uh, my godmother was a children's dress designer. And then when I was about, oh, I mustn't, I must've been about six. Um, my mother took me up to see a production of Peter Pan in London a matinee, it was a big deal. We took the train up to London. And I remember going into this jewel box of a Victorian theater with the burgundy curtains and all the gold and all of the ornamentation of the Victorian jewel box theaters of London. And I was completely transported, completely. And so that led to two years of general art specializing in set and costume design after that. Um, with a focus more on, on costume design. And I love the storytelling. It's not that I don't, I'm not a huge admirer of fashion. Certainly when I was doing Desperate Housewives, I built and designed a lot that we integrated in amongst, you know, fashion from very high end all the way down through, through um, Target and JCPenney. Um, but what I fascinates me and to this day, I absolutely love is creating and discovering about new worlds. I always say to people, I, I think in a weird way, I'm sort of a costume anthropologist <laughs> and storyteller because it's, it's delving into who are they? How do you tell that story? What shoes do they wear? Do they wear underwear? How old are their clothes? What's important to them? And how we telegraph that and how we help bring those stories to life and that that's what gets me excited um, with every new project I take on. And the history you learn or the alternative reality that you create from, from that history, whatever that history is, whether it's reality like doing Perry Mason and being in 1933 Los Angeles, or whether it's to your point, Alien Nation, where I spent the first thing I did was say, okay, can you tell me about these people who've come to earth? <laughs> Why have they come to Earth? What was their other world like? How important was it to them? How much of the culture do they need to bring with them? Do they care about the culture? Um, because those are the questions I think if you ask any of us, and you have because you, you're you wonderful about interviewing us costume designers. Oh, well, thank you. Those are the questions we all ask. Well, it's... Since that you, was probably more of a monologue than you no, wanted. <laughs> no, no, are you? No, that was fantastic because, okay, now I've got to ask you about <laughs> a movie that is near and dear to my heart for various reasons. But now we live in a world where comic book movies are the norm. Mm -hmm. People are, but you, you worked on a comic book movie. A lot of people sometimes. Let's. How should we call it? It doesn't. It doesn't ever rise to the top of their favorite mm -hmm. comic book movies list. However, I dearly love it, if for no other reason than the cast. Yeah. And I'm of course talking about Steel, yeah. that was also directed by Kenneth Johnson, who mm -hmm. created like the Six Million Dollar Man, the V miniseries, and he created Alien Nation. In fact, 
in Steel, he brought Gary Graham and Eric Pierpoint to be in the movie. Yep. Shaquille O'Neal, Annabeth Gish, Richard Roundtree. Yeah. My Richard. God, Judd Nelson. Uh, yep. Charles Napier, who was in an original Star Trek episode called The Way to Eden back in the 60s. I mean, this is a crazy project. And then the character of Steel had been pivotal in a couple of years before there was the Superman in the comics died. And his character was brought back in the reign of Superman storyline that the character of Steel himself was a big part of. And I just I just have to ask you, what was it like to work on Steel and 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 creating that costume and working with those actors? Because what a what a great cast. They uh, yeah, Richard. Uh, uh, well, they all were. Um, I do. Remember- Tanya Alda is in that movie. <laughs> Sorry? Rutania Alda's in that movie. I mean, incredible. Yes. Um, again, Kenny was was very open. And uh, because I'd worked with Gary Wisner, the production designer, before, we had a um, we had a relationship and a communication that worked in terms of color palette and and way of being. And and Kenny wanted it grounded in so that as much of it as possible was familiar. That was important to him, that it it felt accessible. So that lovely junkyard that's near downtown, <laughs> um, that now I think has a school built on it, um, that, that Gary really pushed for us to, to use. Um, so it was, it was stylizing it, but in a way that hopefully didn't alienate it because to your point of the type of superhero movie it was and then in terms of the um the steel armor if you like that was um that was a joint effort between um between the between some specialty makers Mm. um myself and the studio because of its link with the um with the comics and that's not unusual. Um, but the biggest thing that always made me laugh was Kenny wanting pieces of it to fall off. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's that wonderful piece where a bit falls off and he's trying to put it back on again. And again, that spoke to to Kenny's um, sense of humor. Right. And uh, Richard Roundtree, I mean, that's a dream of a lifetime. I've worked with some amazing actors. Um, but working with Mr. Rountree was, was truly, truly an honor and could not have been a more gracious, more delightful, more charming human being if his life had depended upon it. <laughs> so that's not dishing. That's just saying, I suspect what any other designer would say about the man, thoroughly professional. I love the, I love him especially when he's got the hat on the goggles on his on his forehead and he's in the leather um founder's apron is just one of my favorite images i think i still i know i still have it and you're reminding me i should put it back on my website because it's it's just such a good one well it's your your career especially like in the 90s was so eclectic and interesting to me well another movie you had done i know what you did last summer you did steal you also did basketball i know <laughs> with, with Trey Parker and Matt Stone, the, the empresarios behind South Park, and and Academy Award winner, I believe, Ernest Borgnine was in that movie. Marty, Marty that. himself, you know, and and that was a, a, a it was um, a David Zucker, you know, th- like airplanes. That uh, yes. uh, I mean, yes. And so, every every Saturday um, at that point. Um, I was partnered and had a small child, um, a very small child, and was grateful that it was in Los Angeles because I've been on the road a lot. Um, and every Saturday at about 11 o'clock, um, I'd sit down and take deep breaths because I would inevitably get a call from, from the writers who are genius. And they'd go, Kate, um, where are you? <laughs> and I'd say, I'll be right there. And they had offices um, on the west side. And I would drive over there with my notebook and I'd sit down and they go, we were thinking it would be fun if, and I'd go, 
okay. <laughs> um, I think my favorite piece is they came up with the halftime show where they've got <laughs> yeah. giant hats and the mariachi at uh, the the big. Um, they came up with that literally over a holiday weekend. And I called International Silks and Wools. So it's I'm, I'm very touched that they are sponsoring this episode because they wow. have saved me more times than you can imagine. And I literally, true story, I literally, it was a Friday and I called Safwat and I said, Safwat, it, it's Kate. Um, would you mind staying open a few minutes longer? And to bless them, they stayed open. I got there. I knew that they wanted all these dancing girls. And um, <laughs> I knew what they wanted Matt and Trey in roughly. And I said to them, you're just going to have to go with whatever I come up with. And we literally, I worked out the costumes based on how much fabric was available. So we had enough yardage. Wow. And then from there, um, my the gal who was supervising more for me, Buffy Snyder, she drove and I sketched um, very badly <laughs> in the passenger seat with all the fabric in the back of the car. And we went to a subcontractor who then had the samples made overnight. I went and looked at the samples for the girls and for Matt and Trey on the Saturday afternoon. So right. they had just under 24 hours. They made them over the long weekend. She and I bought the shoes downtown and Matt and Trey's hats. She coordinated everything getting fire retarded so that Matt and Trey wouldn't, you know, explode. And then the clothes literally were driven in to, and I found the bikinis for the base and the clothes literally, we were filming at what the place that used to be the boxing arena near downtown, right? which is now the Korean church. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We were filming in that space and they literally, somebody drove a truck. One of the teams just picked everything up, drove the truck into the parking lot the girls had already done gone through hair makeup the floral accessories the shoes the bikinis and we literally dressed them as they walked in wow to film on a so you see you brought up one of my strange films <laughs> well i mean that it's it's so funny because you you have such an eclectic uh you know you're working doing these different kinds of films and now had you ever had you ever had writers call you like that before? Like the writing staff calling you to... to I've you... had it a few times. Um, there was a similar one on season one or two of Desperate where Mark okay. called me in and he suddenly had this wonderful idea of Gabby was um, promoing a car uh, on a turnstile and it was about 4 o'clock and 4, 4.30 in the afternoon and he thought it would be very funny if the if the train of the dress got caught in the turnstile of the car of the um and i remember going into my producer into george perkins and saying george uh, do you have a minute <laughs> because i would imagine there's safety issues and all kinds of well, things well it also shot the next morning <laughs> so we got permission because the show was so huge we did a we did a price analysis and actually the workroom at Universal stayed open all the way through the night. Wow. Yeah. And we had to start with something that existed and that then I re rebuilt. So there was one of us, it was before uh, FaceTime and we were on walkie talkies and I had one of my crew in Glendale. I had another at the Beverly Center. I had somebody in Topanga and I had myself in Glendale. And we all, until we could find seven dresses so that we could cut some of them up. Wow. <laughs> so now, I have a few of these wackadoodle stories, but I think we all do. Yeah, absolutely. But, I, you know, you went from, I mean, you did horror, you were doing science fiction, you were doing mm -hmm. comedy. Then you work with Sly. You worked yep. on a, a movie called Detox or AKA I See You. 
Yes. Um, and you're working with, you're dressing Sylvester Stallone. Yep. You know, and, and now that was, I mean, I guess call that a thriller. Um, yep. Uh, it, it was, I, I would ask, do you approach genres differently? Like as a costume designer, mm -hmm. in terms of humor, in terms of, of, of uh, or is it all the same? Do you, do you always base it on the script, the director's vision, the, the actors yes. themselves? I, I'm, I'm very, I mean, at the end of the day, I'm very classically trained. So I start with, um, I, I had a wonderful professor at art school who was like, start with what's on the page, start with what's on the page. So I start with what, what the script or the story is telling me, which is why I think the writers being acknowledged is really important because if we, we have to have a story there to build on. Now, once we have a good story, what direction it takes and how we, I wouldn't necessarily say elevate it, but how we bring it to life in full fruition mm. um, it is a different piece of the story. But then that's up to my producers and my directors to tell me. I think sometimes it's almost more difficult to do something that doesn't draw attention to itself than something that does draw attention to itself. Um, if you're doing basketball and they're saying, oh gosh, we love the idea that you do all these cheerleaders. So now we want you to do different cheerleaders in every single game, which is what happened to me. So I'm wandering around the crew saying, okay, so what's your fetish? <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, oh, it's, and I'm like, no, no, we've done that. So give me another one. Um, but I think it's, I, I think that's very different than for instance, with my recent work with Perry Mason, where I, my crew were amazing at helping me, I hope for anyone who watches it, my mandate to myself and in talking to Team Downey and to Michael and Jack was that I wanted you to feel as though every single frame looked like an old photograph or an old piece of research. So if you took the color out completely, it looked like a Dorothea Lang. It looked like old Los Angeles. And with all the different stratas of people that existed at that time, so even though it's a costume drama, sure, I wanted it to look real. And sometimes I think that's almost more difficult mm. because you're trying to not draw attention to yourself or sure. to your work. Um, you're trying to ground the actors in a way that when they walk onto the set, they truly feel as though they've gone through a door in time. Mm. That's interesting. I, you know, I like that. Uh, that's, that's very cool. Um, Thank you. You, when you, you, oh, so you, you were working on features and, mm -hmm. and a, a, a wide variety of features. And then you kind of went into television and after doing, you did a, went a date with Tad Hamilton too. But then after, which was, which I actually liked that movie quite a bit, to be honest. Um, but then you went into TV and then you found yourself uh, working on you did uh, the district, you did Hallelujah, but then uh, design uh, uh, Desperate Housewives. Mm -hmm. That that show became iconic. I mean, that mm -hmm. was at the time it became one of the most massive. And you were on that for what seven seasons? I was on it for. Um, I didn't do the pilot or the first episode, but I took over during the second episode. Mm. I was on it for eight years. Eight years. Um, and, but it, I mean, I'm just sorry, I need to readjust myself, but it was, um, how do I do this? Um, it was a blessing in that um, I am partnered. I'm happily, happily married. Um, my son was, was growing up and it meant I was able to stay in town and be present for a number of the events and major events in his life. It was also at a time where um, my in-laws um, passed and then I also lost um, my parents passed. Oh. And so while there was a piece of me that missed television uh, uh, films, I also say that 
Desperate Housewives was a huge gift. And I learned an awful lot during that time because we were doing so much clothing and we were dealing with so many women and keeping each of them in their own piece of the visual puzzle right. and it not becoming muddled or murky um, was, and the logistics behind that was a whole different set of challenges than I had pretty much than I had experienced to date. I mean, there were, there were times when we would do upward of 18 changes on one of the girls in a one hour episode, which I don't think people really noticed because Mark was wonderful at doing these little tiny flashbacks. And he has an amazing memory. So he'd pull me into his office and say, remember when Brie was doing a flower arrangement in season one? And it would be season six. And he'd say, I'd really like to put that into that little piece that's in page 30, you know, scene, blah, blah. And I'd be like, okay. <laughs> so we we didn't get rid of anything unless we had to. Um, and I designed a lot of it, a lot of pretty much all the wedding dresses, all the bridesmaids, um, a lot of the, a lot, of pe- a lot more pieces I think were made than people realize. Well, on a show like that, obviously, like, I think when you start working on a TV show, you're hoping it's well received because TV is a, you know, it's a cruel mistress. Sometimes you'll be on a show and then suddenly it's canceled. But but then the other side of that is when you're on a show that suddenly becomes a a water cooler show. Everyone's talking about it. Everyone wants to, you know, is, is analyzing it. Now, for you as a designer, especially when these women are front and center, and obviously fashion is incredibly important to both the characters in the story and the actresses themselves, mm-hmm. I would only imagine that that was, was, was that overall a great experience for you? Because I would imagine, was there more pressure for you as a costume designer on a show like that? Because I would imagine that once it became a hit, were, were designers coming after you going, can you feature this? Can, were they throwing dresses and things at you 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 ask you you ask a really great question um it was all of those things right (laughs) it really was um i remember um george perkins pulling me into his office and saying um and he had a love he has a lovely sense of humor and they would they would pull pranks on me every now and again and (laughs) he pulled me into his office and he uh he said kate um Newsweek wants to do the cover with the girls. And I just laughed. I said, okay, George, that's really funny. I need to go back to work now. (laughs) He said, no, actually, I'm serious. And I said, Newsweek? You want to put it on the cover of Newsweek? Um, And he explained that we're going to have to do each of the girls individually, and then they were going to put them all together. We were so busy staying ahead of the show and I think that was the gift because if I'd had more time to think about it I Mm. think it would have probably been a lot more daunting than it was and yes stuff got thrown at us um but ABC had some very strict rules around that which was great oh that's interesting Um, okay and at the same time they had hired me because they wanted they wanted each of the women to have their own their own piece of the puzzle. So there are colors of purple that are dusty, dusty colors and smoky colors that Susan wears, that Gabrielle never wears, that Brie never wears. So even even though they all wore at one time or another certain colors, they were never within the same piece of that puzzle. So people sending us stuff didn't necessarily help. If that makes okay. sense. Okay. Yeah. No, that totally makes sense because you have to you have to tell the story. Yes. You know, it's exactly. it's it's not like you know I would imagine, but I, I, on a show like that, because of its popularity, that you would have just been deluged with every designer in the world saying, "Please use my." <laughs> it was also a little early for I think what's epidemic now. Right. Yeah, yeah. We did have we definitely had people who came in and looked at. Um, all of my continuity books Mm. and then did the sort of three clicks through to the get the look 
um, whereas now it's just blatant, um, <laughs> which is probably a, a different podcast for us to do. Um, right. right. <laughs> and uh, there were a series of dolls that came out that were mm -hmm. based on my designs that literally they just said, we need these photographs from your continuity book. And then nobody really talked to me. And then suddenly there were dolls. I was like, oh, I, I oh gosh, yes. Yeah, how about getting some credit? Like, Never like you, you know, it's funny as you, you can see, we, we talked about this too. I, I, as a high end action figure collector, I kind of, it would be interesting to know because on this show, we've talked to so many designers. Now you doing steel where you can mm -hmm. get figures and you can get representations of these characters in various formats and every shape, size, the action figures come in. And yet the costume designer isn't mentioned, you I know, know and, and you don't, it, it's, it's in a way it's sort of frustrating in the sense that especially some of these characters have multiple iterations of costumes over yeah. multiple movies. And why not, why not credit the costume designers? I know on superhero movies like Marvel movies, they have a visual design department that, that comes up with these things, but then the costume designer still has to figure out like, well, what, what is this made out of? You know? and, and also proportionally, how is it going to work? Yeah. I, I was down at Comic-Con in um, uh, a few years ago um, in San Diego, and it was a huge win for us within the costume, uh, within the costume designers guild, um, the year that they did all the stormtroopers and every single one of them had the credit below. Yep. I remember um, that on the big display, big display. Yep. I was there. It was fantastic. Remember that? Yep. And that for that year for us, I believe, and you may know more about it than I do with your wonderful collection. I think <laughs> that that was, that was the first time that I remember, because I've been on the CDG board for gosh, 10 years now. Mm. I think that was the first year where we were like, gosh, we've actually managed to make sure that every single one of our designers and even some of the people who aren't in our guild are given credit next to their costumes. Um, well, it's interesting that, that like you think about things like, well, Star Wars and Star Trek that have published literally books about the costume mm -hmm. design have, have at least acknowledged where all these designs come from. And, and like John Molo, who I remember from Star mm -hmm. Wars and, and, and people like that. Growing up, I knew the names of certain costume designers and, mm -hmm. and, and nowadays I, I would think that they would want to support those kinds of things more than they do and celebrate yeah. the 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 art of costumes like like shauna who's working on mandalorian and stuff now mm -hmm. i interviewed her um and she was great you know and and she's integral to making those shows yeah. work and and having that design continuity and, and also with at places like comic-con with all the cosplaying that goes on yeah. You know, now now you have kids growing up that are making their own costumes and they want to know every last detail of what, what goes into making these and costumes. And they work really, really hard, as you know, from both of us being down there. They work incredibly hard to bring that detail to life and mm. to um and and, and they, they care about it. Mm -hmm. And the difference between what we, it sort of goes back to what I said earlier, the difference between us reading something on the page and then reading something on the page and saying, but then what happens if we do this? Yeah. How, and how, do, how do we take that and bring it to life and make it special, make it twinkle, make it sparkle, make it. Um, I got sent a, a fascinating piece just yesterday from uh, Instagram, from another costume designer. And it was the top 10 pieces from film and television uh, that have been sold at auction. Okay. Okay. There's only two of them that are jewelry. Wow. Okay. Everything else, everything else is a piece of costume from a movie, every single piece. Wow. Or it's from a special event that was designed by a costume designer, or okay. it's associated. So it's um, yeah, this is your a... dress from Breakfast at Tiffany. Okay, it's sure. The, it's it's Marilyn's dress over the um, over Great. the subway boat. Um, it's Dorothy's shoes. 
just saying. If you go to West, I always say to, when I'm lucky enough to be on a panel or something, I always say, if you go into West Hollywood at Halloween, people have not dressed as the set. <laughs> no disrespect to my production designers who I love. Sure. But you are going to see still people dressed from Mona May's designs from Clueless. You are still going, you're going to see characters from The Mandalorian. Well, um, and, and it, because those, you know, it's, it's, the costumes are, are where character sort of begins. Yes. You know, I've often, I've often told people, and I've spoken about this, I said, the people about ind making independent movies, I've said, okay, the, the most important hires on an independent movie, or on any movie, really, is first and foremost, the caterers. People always yeah. laugh at me. And I'm like, look, man, if you want people, if you're going to produce a movie, you have one chance, and mm -hmm. that is the first lunch on the first day of shooting, you to prove to your crew that you're going to take care of them. <laughs> and yep. that that is that first day. But the other two hires that are most important are hair and makeup and costume design. Mm -hmm. Because... They're your first defense, your only defense with your actors, yeah. And and you don't want to worry about your actors. You want to make sure that they're taken care of. The only way you can do that is a hair and makeup, because they're like the therapists yep. of the of the of the of the of the set, and because they're literally in the face, you know. Mm -hmm. And then the costume designers are are kind of like uh, mission control, because yep. they have to. They're launching. They're launching the actors out into the onto the set, and um, if if everything isn't just so, yeah. and the actors doubt how they look, which they never should, because you want them to worry about their character and acting and all that, those two departments and people look at me like I'm crazy, and I'm like, you'll see, just remember, <laughs> you'll see, but 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 I think that that's you know that's true. Like, I'll ask you this: like working on 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 uh, Desperate Housewives over eight years. How did you mm -hmm. keep it fresh from year to year? Because fashion trends, were you keeping up with the fashion of the day? I mean, I know it was kind of... Yeah, was... no, you, I, it, um, I suppose I was. But again, I think it goes back to that whole research thing. You, mm. Once I finished Desperate Housewives, I, I had to take a break. And the passing of my mother helped in, in the sense that I needed to sort of tidy up after her passing. But I saw everything through the lens of Desperate Housewives. I saw color and texture and silhouette and no, that doesn't work. And they may be trying to pitch that at Bloomingdale's or in Vogue, but it, it doesn't make sense for our show. Um, and the same thing with, with Perry, when I finished Perry, um, I had to take a break because I was seeing everything through the lens of um, of fabrics that are more difficult to find right now. Um, right. Okay. Heavier wools, um, things with a different texture, uh, color palette that was was different, even though we desaturated it in post. Um, silks and bias cut. Um, so looking around at sort of floral prints and cotton was just a bit like, yeah, no, because it wasn't part of the world that I'd lived in for over a year between the research and us filming and the making of, we made nearly 900 pieces of clothing for the, for the season. And we did, we dressed, we reckon we dressed probably somewhere close to 13,000 extras. Wow. Because we were in all these different pieces of LA. So somebody who was working in my Hooverville could be the shoe shine person or the person street sweeping the street when we were in downtown LA. But the person who was at the piano recital or at the gay women's bar wouldn't be at Sonny's grocery store. Right. Okay. So there was monitoring where the extras worked and where they could work and where they couldn't work. But there was also the changes in the schedule because of COVID. So my crew would do an amazing job, you know, and we'd pre-fit 350 extras for a scene. Um, and then the schedule would change. And we'd have all of that in hot stock and then we'd discover half of those people weren't available.
So wow. then we'd have to redo it all. So, um, but I find for me, because I, to your, the point that you so graciously pointed out earlier, I really love delving into all sorts of different worlds. Right. I love it. It, it's, it, and the more diversity you give me, the happier I am. So because of that, yes, I need to take, I, I need to, whenever possible, hopefully not for too long, I need to take a little break between, between worlds because I get very tunnel visioned into seeing color and texture and silhouette and shape and way of being very much in that world that I've been living in visually. And I think that's good because then if you look at a line of extras or an actor says to you, what about this? You know whether it's right or not. You just know it in, in your gut. Um, well, at least I think so. I hope so. Well, I think, I think you did do that. And, and what's really interesting to me is, is you went on and did, um, you did Bosch, you know, and uh -huh. I, I read all the Michael Connelly novels and I was, I was a huge fan of that show. That's contemporary LA. Mm -hmm. But then after that, you, your projects like the sun was a period piece with James mm -hmm. Bond, uh, the man in the high castle, again, an alternate reality uh -huh. kind of back and forth, which also had period stuff. And, and then, um, Perry Mason was, was another, a period is another period piece. Mm -hmm. uh, and you worked on all those. And do you like working in period? And is there, I asked somebody else this, is it when you're working in a period piece, is it important to be historically accurate or is it more important to make people look good using the fabrics oh, of the day? I, I would answer that by personally by saying it depends on the story. Okay. Because I like Man in the High Castle, like, you've got some leeway because it's alternate yeah. reality. But with Man in the High Castle, again, the mandate um, from my um, my showrunners in taking that over was you wanted to, and I, I agreed with them, you wanted to believe that that was a trajectory that the world could have taken. Right, okay. But okay, so again, in, in saying so that, did that did 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 the fashion designers that actually existed in our world, like you said, Gavinci, somebody or or a Rudy, what is it, Gern, Gernreich, Rudy? Uh, yes. Who, so what I, I tell you what I did, I looked at <clears throat> German fashion from the uh, towards the end of the Second World War. And the Germans were desperate to, they wanted to be the new Paris. Okay. But their aesthetic is completely different. Right. And when you move into a world where people, women were getting medals for how many babies they had, did you know this? Yes. Okay. For the fatherland, so you know. If you cranked out eight babies, you got to wear this fabulous gold medal that you could parade around as you went out shopping. That, to me, spoke of a world that was deliberately subjugating and controlling and keeping the status quo. Mm. So a lot of the fashion that I designed and had made in season three and season four, uh, and all of Mrs. Smith was built, um, almost all of Juliana was built, a lot of the principles were built for that. I literally looked and keyed off of the end of the Second World War and fashion, German fashion at that time. Whereas with the West Coast, because it was the Japanese yeah. and they were fascinated with Americana, it was a little bit more, let's look at what America was doing and phasing into. And then from there as a launching pad, then what would those two different cultures have done? Wow. <clears throat> Whereas for the, for the neutral zone, it was just a hodgepodge of anything you could get your hands on because it was all of the, the disenfranchised. Well, it's and fascinating. The, I, I mean, I love this this philosophical approach to this that you have. This is what I love to hear that you did these deep dives. So how how important is research to you? And in terms mm -hmm. of like if you discover certain kinds of fabrics that were used at the time, 
um, do you think that it, it, do you have to then go after those fabrics and do you want to really make it as authentic as possible? Because especially like, I have no sense of fashion at all in my life. Give me t-shirts and jeans and I'm fine. But I love fashion when I see it on screen. Mm -hmm. I love deep fashion. I love three piece suits and fabrics that mm -hmm. have texture and wools and, when you watch, like, I, I watch a movie like Brian De Palma's The Untouchables, uh -huh. you know, the, and I'm like, I, I, I wish I could live in a world where I could wear Frank Nitti's, like, white suits, you know, or give me some European linen suits where it's, where it's hot in the summer and you're always sweaty, but you're wearing linen so you look good anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so how, how is that in terms of, of historical research and how important is getting the fabric I, I right? Again, I think it depends. It depends on the story. It depends on the piece. Um, I also do like to say we're not making a documentary here. Right. And there are times when um, there are things that you discover in the research that aren't necessarily going to help the story. A case in point in the sun on those borderlands, when you look at the photographic research, um, the a lot of the Mexican community do indeed wear giant sombreros. They, it's in all the photographs. It's in, and um, especially the um, the people who were doing a lot of the fighting and the rebels because it's so bloody hot. And yeah, and we should say that if you haven't seen the sun, it's it's about uh, a Texas. It's oil and me the Mexican Texas border and fighting and how America sort of came to prominence in that time. Thank you for explaining that. So uh, the first thing I did, one of the first things I did was take the photographs to um, Kevin Murphy, my showrunner, and Kevin Dowling, who was directing, and anyone else who would listen and say, I I'm not doing these because I don't want us to go to a Taco Bell commercial immediately. Right. So there are definitely pieces that you take out of the puzzle because you, you want to keep somebody in the story. I said, if, if we put those in, you're going to lose the, people are going to get so fixated or curious about that. It's no, no longer going to be about the story. Um, and that's not to say that there aren't times when I think a brilliant costume does take you out of the story, but in a good way and becomes a toy, to, talking point or becomes an iconic illustration or part of um, mm. our folklore, if you like. Yeah. But it, it has a time and place, I think. Yeah, I, that's, 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 that's very interesting because I, I think too, you know, I, I go back to one of my favorite f costume design films of all time is John Borman's Excalibur. Mm -hmm. And Excalibur from 1981, it's an Arthurian tale. None of the costumes are at all realistic or part of any kind of period. They're, it's totally stylized and totally mm -hmm. designed. And the armor is beautiful. And, and yet it still is evocative of a time and place yeah. that it feels genuine, even though it's not at all. Yeah. And I, and I, think, I think that it's important to, if you know you can get away with it, like you said, we're not making documentaries. Well, and also people's ability to move and to breathe and to um, to function and where that helps the actor because it restricts them, whether it's a corset or a high heel or a guy in a lace up shoe and to your point, a three piece suit. And when it's when it's more helpful to take artistic license. Mm. Um, so finding that balance. And I think, again, that depends on on the story you're telling um so yeah well now you won uh you won an emmy for the mysterious benedict society mm -hmm. which now has the dubious distinction of being taken off of disney plus yeah they just 86 it the other day from yeah. there or they're going to 86 it which is insane i mean it was an eight episode series and um that you worked on and I actually caught it, and I really liked it a lot. And I thought the design work you did, again, was a lot of fun. You yes. know, it 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 was a it was a. Now, obviously, we've seen uh, everything from 
young people i mean you've worked on a lot of of like young people in like the wink saga that was a fate that you worked on a group of young people doing exciting things if they're not getting killed they're solving yep. mysteries you know and you have work with young ensembles what was it like on that show and for the design work what were some of your inspirations and how did you how did you begin working on that show um Again, um, I, st I started, the showrunners were very clear, and I think they were right, that there were enough um, stories in this genre that um, where it's a sort of dark, ominous world. It's always raining or there's, you know, it's intrepidly dangerous. And right. what they thought would be fun is the counterbalance of it being this bright, wonderful world that you wanted to go to and you wanted to live in that had this, um, this disturbing undercurrent that was going to try and take over. Um, so right there, they sort of captured me with, with the fact that it was a twist on, um, on a world that we're used to seeing, if you like. Um, there was a lot of, we, we looked at a lot, the production designer and myself looked at a lot of 60s and 70s pop art. We mm. looked at Wes, and Wes Anderson, obviously. Sure. Um, we looked at all of those things that make you want to go somewhere, that make you want to, even if it's a little, and the quirkiness of life. That was the other thing that um, the showrunners were very clear about. And that was at the core of it. Um, and when I accepted the Emmy, which was a huge honor, um, I said one of the things I loved most about the show, and I still love most about the show, is that none of those children have superpowers. Right. <laughs> They're all quirky. They're all a little offbeat. And they're all very clever at something, but they don't have lightning powers. They don't have, I mean, I suppose, you know, you could say one of them's somewhat telekinetic, but they're, they're kids. And I loved the idea having now raised a child and knowing a lot of children. Um, I loved the idea that this sent a message that it was okay just to be yourself. Sure. You didn't have to apologize for being yourself and you could come to peace with being yourself and that it didn't matter if you were all different. And that's what spoke to me in the first season. The most difficult thing was that we filmed it in Vancouver during the pandemic, mm. with almost everything closed and shut and before the vaccinations. Wow. So, oh man. So were I was you stuck up there. Yes, I, yeah. I got on a plane in July. We started, I started designing it and conceiving it in February. And then March came around and everything just came to a grinding halt. And then they, they had me do a little bit more work. Um, and then they called me in July and said, you're getting on a plane to Vancouver. And I just sort of said, I'm what? <laughs> 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 so... Um, and I remember saying to my family, I'll, this will either all blow over or they'll send me home because we won't be able to do this. Sure. And then we did. Wow. <laughs> so uh, July was August, August was September, September was October, Thanksgiving, um, the winter holidays, Christmas, Hanukkah, New Year's, and then the very last day of, uh, of January. Yeah. <laughs> Tony wow. Hale and I were on an airplane like this. <laughs> um, that's amazing. Well, I mean, you guys did a great job. It's a wonderful looking show. Thank you. So, yeah, I really, I really dug that. Is it harder to design for kids than it is for adults? No, I. The only thing is they grow. This is what's annoying. <laughs> <laughs> they grow. <laughs> you don't have them for a few weeks, or I mean, with. With Benedict, we just knew that it was going to happen. But for instance, Kate's um, high top sneakers, which I I did the hand painting on when I was in quarantine as soon as I got up there. And then my poor team who helped me, I think we ended up making about 15 pairs of them, partly because her feet grew. And then she had three photo doubles because of schooling. 
and then she had a stunt double and then they decided to put her in the water so then we had to do waterproof ones um no i think it's no i don't think it's different i think each person that you help bring to life as a character is different mm. and i i think the finding a common language you know, it's sort of like, hello, how do you do? Let me measure you. Please take most of your clothes off and let's find your character. Right. Um, that's a lot. If if somebody did that to me, I would be, um, I, you know, it, it's like deciding whether to wear a black blouse for you today. That's a lot. But then you think of these actors who come in of all sizes and shapes, all ages. You don't know their history. You don't know what quirks they do or they don't have and you're trying to help them and keep them safe mm. so i don't think it has anything to do with age or experience or life's journey i think it it's just taking a deep breath and going just because this um shorthand language worked with this person i shouldn't assume that it's going to work with the next i need to listen to how they you know it's almost like different radio frequencies i think right sure at least for me it is well then after that you're back into period pieces with with perry mason mm -hmm. you know which is such a funny thing for me because actually I, you know i grew up watching perry mason <laughs> Uh -oh. <laughs> along, I'm, you know and now to, i love the, the well i don't know if i love it but the, i thought the, the the new perry mason show is great really uh -huh. it's, it's sort of the prequel to the perry mason yes. that i grew up with and um uh it's a really terrific show and again beautiful design work beautiful clothing um what was it like going into that that show and was there any kind of a, a a different design philosophy that you brought to it? Was it more, did you have to make it more authentic or did you have more room to sort of, like you said, you're not making a documentary because the clothes in that, in that show are pretty great. Thank you. Um, is it different? I think it's different because it's its own thing. Yeah. How so? Um, and because there are certain silhouettes um, that repeat through history mm. um, because that's where we will get our inspiration. Trying to make sure that it didn't look modern. <laughs> okay. Because, for instance, Stella's red dress that she wears to the piano recital. Women are still wearing fabulous bias cut dresses to premieres and special events today. So how do I put it in a context where somebody might want to go, oh gosh, I'd love to own that piece, but it doesn't look as though I went to Neiman Marcus. Right, okay. Even though I've had a number of emails about pieces in the show um, that have come through my agents where they're like, we think she probably had this made. <laughs> <laughs> do you but get a lot of that? Do, do you get a lot of inquiries um, you know like that? What? Actually, I'm, I do. And actually, my agent sent me another one just the other day and said, it's odd, Kate, you seem to get more of these than, than most of our clients, even though their client list is amazing. So I don't know. I don't know whether that's just the work I've done recently or whether it's the nature of some of the shows that I have designed. Hmm. Every now and again, I still get somebody asking about a wedding dress from Desperate Housewives. I'm well, like, with, <laughs> in the streaming world, these shows are now readily available, so people I can binge them and more see them more than they've ever seen them before. And people watch that stuff. I have a friend of mine who's watched like would anytime you go to her house, Law and Order was just on, just playing like twenty four seven, because there's enough where you can you can leave it on for weeks. Yes. And never yeah, see all true. of them. And and I would imagine that if you're a fan of the show, people just binge over and over and over again. And yeah. especially you can, you suddenly notice things you might not notice. And you've worked on these iconic things like Desperate Housewives will probably be watched forever. You know, I can imagine. Probably. <laughs> 
but Perry Mason's very cool because you're dealing with the 30, 30s LA. Yeah. Um, and so there was obviously Hollywood. There was a glitz and glamour to. I mean, I, I love period LA. I mean, I think about like LA Confidential had great costumes Amazing. in it. Yeah. Um, but but that was in the fifties, forties, fifties, and fifties yeah. because television was was big. Yeah. So it was the fifties. Whereas you're twenty years before that in the thirties, which is a great time in LA because we still had glitz and glamour because of Hollywood. Sound had just become was less than five years old or something. So it was. It, 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 yeah, I mean, Los Angeles in the 30s is I've, you've got casinos three miles out and you've yeah. got you've got Hoovervilles that look lost in time. And you've got you're right. You've got the glitz and glamour and you've got them building coffee shops in the shape of coffee, <laughs> coffee. you know coffee cups and hot dog stands that are hot dogs. I, the production designer, Keith, and I became obsessed with this stuff because <laughs> Um, you know, you couldn't put it into every single frame, but we were like, we have to do some of this stuff because it's, um, I found, I think actually what got me the job, one of the things that hopefully got me the job, actually, I, I do know it did get me the job because they told me afterwards. I found a research photograph that amazingly they hadn't seen, which was quite hard. And it wasn't that I I should paraphrase this. It wasn't that I went, oh gosh, I have to find a photograph they haven't seen. It's just to your point, because this is such a fascinating time period in LA's history, there's, there is a lot of documentation out there. Yeah. But I managed to find a picture. It's a vintage car. It's a series of vintage cars on a new subdivision and some of the houses are built and there's a long piece of rope and there's a giant cube of ice with a girl in sort of a bathing suit ish sort of outfit holding on to the top of the block of ice and it's a race wow to promote a subdivision wow <laughs> and it had the it it was exactly of that time period we we knew that from the cars and the the clothes oh that's amazing they must have loved that um unfortunately they kept trying to put it in the into the show and it just wouldn't fit it'd just be but too to weird point, people would be like what what is that <laughs> but to your point that's um the stuff was i mean it's just a it's a banquet of amazing extraordinary uh, cross-purposes things uh, going on in the city Oh, it's great stuff. And and now you're working on another L.A. period piece in a way, um, mm -hmm. which, you know, is kind of it's it's interesting because we had we had a show about the Lakers, a TV show. Uh -huh. a good sh now we're going to have a TV show about Doc Rivers and the Clippers. Yep. And uh, the Sterling Affairs. And, yes. and that's what you're working on now. So and isn't uh, Larry Fishburne? Uh, Lawrence, Lawrence, La Lawrence Fishburne. Lawrence Pardon me. Fishburne. He's Lawrence now. I, I still think because even in Apocalypse oh, Now, he's built his lair. Mr. Fishburne. When I first met him, I said, how would you like me to address you, sir? He's, I mean, again, I had an amazing cast on that. I had Ed O'Neill. I had, oh, uh, I had, uh, yeah, it, you're right. People don't think of 10 years ago being period. <laughs> it kind of was, though. But it way. is. Yeah. Um, I, I came in, they, they would sort of gone in a different direction and it was in some trouble. So I came in about a week before we started filming, which was a little bit tight, I won't lie. Um, but the pandemic has changed how we see everything in the world. Right. It's changed how we grocery shop. It's changed how we buy socks and underwear and whether it's permissible to go somewhere in Lululemon leggings, you know, it, it's just a different piece of the world. And guys were not showing their ankles and not wearing socks with their dress shoes, you know. Um, so that again was, hey guys, 10 years ago is 10 years ago. And even though it's only 10 years ago, visually, it was a completely different world. Yeah. Um, yeah. The uniforms, when when basketball shorts went up and down, and when they were tight and when they weren't, and how much padding you wore underneath, and when Under Armour came into um, into its own, and 
the different shoes, the shoes were impossible. We, so when you see it, be patient with the shoes because some of the guys were, were being sponsored. Some of them weren't, some of those shoes still exist. Some of them don't, some mm. of them we found, but then they fell apart because they actually had to play in them. That yeah. was exciting. Um, but again, it's a fascinating, weird piece of LA story. It's really weird, but it's, it's all good. Now I got to ask you as a geek, was it hard for you not to call Lawrence Fishburne Morpheus? Did you ever want to say, did anyone ever call? Cause you know, I would, I'd have to say. Okay. So actually I have a very sweet story about this. Um, my, my godson, um, one of my godchildren, um, Oliver, who's in fifth grade and his father is from South Africa and his father is a huge, a huge um, Matrix fan. And so I was talking to them over the weekend and um, via Zoom and, uh, and Oliver said to his father, well, daddy, who's Auntie Kate working with? And he said, well, he, he's, he's working and he referenced the Matrix. And Oliver looked at him and said, no, no, daddy, he's not. Auntie Kate, send me a picture. So I sent a picture. He said, no, daddy, that, that's not him. That's grandpa from Blackish. <laughs> Which was the sweetest thing ever. So when, when Lawrence came into work on Monday, I said, Lawrence, I have a very sweet story for you if you have a minute. He said, sure, Kate. I said, well, my godson, Oliver, he doesn't know anything other than the fact that you're the cool grandpa from blackish <laughs> and lawrence just let out that wonderful rich laugh of his and he said kate that's a first i said well you've got a whole other generation and as far as they're concerned your grandpa <laughs> i don't know if that's something an actor wants to hear but that's probably great <laughs> yeah, I think he was tickled it wasn't about his age it sure. was about his role about, it was about the role he didn't I, know anything about the Matrix. It's funny because because he more than like Lawrence Fishburne in the eighties was so ubiquitous. He turned up everywhere, yeah. you know. Beginning, he was fourteen years old when he made Apocalypse Now, and then he showed was up. He in, really? Gosh, yeah, I suppose he was. Yeah, he yeah. was fourteen years old, and 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 when he started, and then he was in everything from you name it, King of New York, Color Purple with Spielberg. Yeah, you know he's had such a great career. I just watched a um. It was on the Criterion uh, Blu-ray for his movie Undercover that uh -huh. he stars in, which he just delivers a searing performance. And he does a great interview uh, on that disc. I think it was like at New York Film School or something, NYC. Uh, but it was incredible interview. And he's just an incredibly smart, really interesting guy that has had such an amazing yeah. career. And continues to. And, yeah, and is yeah. incredibly hardworking, clears, done his homework, uh, all the things. Yeah, he's amazing. Um, yeah. And it was, again, it was a Jackie Weaver. It was more startling that the story is the story. Yeah. And it's only 10 years ago. I know. I mean, they would have a white party at the beginning of every season to introduce the players. Yeah. And I was like, what <laughs> and then i went to youtube and i was like oh my gosh yep <laughs> couldn't make this stuff up no um, but i'm i'm excited to to see it um i th i think it's i think we have to keep telling these stories i mean i suppose if there is a through line to a lot of my work and it's really only just it dawned on me as as we've talked so i i thank you for that i have been so far, and please God, it continues. I've been blessed to be given a lot of projects that beyond entertaining actually have, I think, some important things to say. Yeah, absolutely. Because um, the Sterling Affairs, we don't even want to go there because it's just disturbing and chilling. Um, Perry Mason 
we deal with um, the haves and the have nots mm -hmm. and money and greed um, and people thinking that because they're at that level, they can, the rules don't apply to them. In um, High Castle, I dealt with what would happen if, and yeah. let's, let's think about that carefully as we move forward in life and continue to. And it, it becomes more relevant by the day. Yes. <laughs> so, yes. Well, listen, I've kept you long. This has been a great conversation. I've so enjoyed speaking with you. I was very excited to do this. But let me ask you, we always ask everybody, you know, a lot of people, I mean, might want to get into this profession. What mm -hmm. advice can you offer people that are just starting out? I mean, obviously, the way people can use Instagram and, and all the, the, the tools that are available because of the internet and things. But still, I think I've heard it's important. I, I still hear it's important, and I know it's important to learn the basics, to learn things yeah. about fabrics and colors. And what can you tell people if they want to want to get into this profession? Where can they begin? Um, I I would say one of for me, I would say one of two routes. Um, I would say either start by going to school, at, whether it's night school or. Um, community college or a formal degree. Start, if you can do that, um, I don't think there's a downside in it because the access you have to storytellers and to guest lecturers um, and getting more dug into that world um, and some time to think and sort it through is very important. After that, I would say and or is, is start as a, as a production assistant. Start as a production assistant and a production assistant in a costume department, if you possibly can, mm. um, or certainly in a production office and see if it's what you really want to do. Because what I think I've learned from Comic-Con is that some people at the end of the day absolutely love what we do, but it's a lot more fun for them and their lifestyle to do cosplay or to have it as a, um, as a recreation as a hobby right. because it, it does take, take over. Um, that said, otherwise talk to everybody, pick their brains, watch them. Um, I try on my shows to make sure that the younger ones coming up, that they can ghost me when they, when it's possible that they can, even if they can't actually do any of it, that they can follow me to IS and W and see how I choose fabric and answer questions for them and look at my research. Um, talk to different designers, talk to different people in the industry, talk to people like yourself who have a really good overview. Hmm. Um, because I think knowledge is, is an extraordinary gift. I, um, every job I do, I learn something new. It's fantastic. No, I mean, that's one of the great, the great benefits of working in the entertainment business, working on films and television is, mm -hmm you never stop learning. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's, that's what makes it so exciting. Uh, you know, I, I look at like Clint Eastwood's 92 years old and he's directing his last movie. He's 92. I, I just bumped into Barbara uh, uh, Hopper literally on Saturday, I think. Um, and she's just starting to design his next movie for him. I yeah. mean, it's incredible. Fantastic. And, yeah, and you look at a lot of the people, Martin Scorsese r making mm -hmm. a three-hour movie about the Osage yeah. Indians. And, and then Which you I'm have... I'm excited to see. I can't wait. I mean, they're yeah. coming out of Cannes, the notices, and then you've got Ridley Scott doing Napoleon. Yep. <laughs> you know, and, and that that's uh, incredible, too. So And he's in his mid-80s. So there's no reason to stop ever. I, I don't ever want to stop working. So Well, I mean, you, you think of some of, some of our most experienced and most talented costume designers. Oh, you know, I mean, they keep going. Mar it, it... Mar Marlena just finished. Um, and I mean, the trailers of that just look glorious. Yeah. And, uh, and incredible. And uh, Cruella. I mean, seriously. Oh, yeah. Miss Bevan went from Cruella to Mad, Ma Mad Max to Cruella. I mean, yeah, the and woman, she, I interviewed her. She's amazing. Isn't she fabulous? I love her. I, I love her. Just, yeah, we, we had lunch recently and she's just, 
she but that's I think that's what we all aspire to hopefully be in terms of mentorship and education and diversity of work um, yeah I, I mean, one of the things for me that's fun about doing these shows is like asking you about alienation I, I was interviewing Ellen Mirajnik and um, uh -huh. who also love her and, but I had to say I had to go okay let's I'm gonna take you back to basic instinct you uh -huh. had Michael Douglas wearing a V-neck sweater going to a club to see, to meet Sharon Stone. I'm like, come on. Uh, why? He's got to know to dress better than that. And I go, you got to tell me the story. And she told me the story, you know, and I'm like, uh -huh. she laughed that I even fixated on that. I'm like, look, you know, there's these movies we fixate on. I've seen Basic Instinct a thousand times. Yeah. And it's that V-neck sweater. Why? Yeah. What, what, what is that? That cashmere sweater he wears to a club? Like, who does that? <laughs> it was the best but that's what's and so she great. Has great and she has great stories uh she's amazing she was so i i, I want to party with her <laughs> but again a very diverse oh the incredible world i mean yeah. the funny thing about i i think what's really interesting in the in the age that we live in especially in the post home video or streaming era where you can watch things over and over and over again mm -hmm. you know a lot of the time especially for me who's watched lots of movies over and over again when i interview certain designers like Marilyn Vance, whose podcast this is, I, uh -huh. can, I can say to her, like, I'm still looking for the leather duster that Michael Pere was wearing in 1984 Streets of Fire. And right. and she'll laugh and tell me about how hard it was to get the leather to make that jacket, yeah. you know, and, and but these are weird. They're just weird. Like, I have a whole head full of weird pieces of clothing and movies that I like for whatever reason <laughs> to be able to find out, like, where did that come from <laughs> and why? Because mm -hmm. people fixate on. That's yeah. why people still dress up as Marilyn Monroe, you know, yeah. for, and it's, yeah. it's, it, cause they mean something, you know, yeah. it, 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 it means in people's minds, what is fashion? And now it's kind of an amalgamation of like, everyone knows when you say eighties fashion, everybody knows what that looks like. But mm -hmm. nowadays there's, it's such a, it's all mix and match. There's, we yeah. don't have distinct fashion, like eras don't. It's like everything now because kids are yeah. looking at the yeah. internet and they have access to what things like back in the mm -hmm. '60s, and so everything is so, which I which I like, which I think is yeah. kind of neat. It's kind of neat, so it's a good time. But listen, can I call you Kate? I was in Catherine. Absolutely. Okay, everyone yes. says, Absolutely. "Well, Kate Adair, uh, this has been an amazing conversation." Um, I, I again, I I've had such a great time speaking with you. I want to thank you for taking the time to be on the Designing Hollywood podcast. Thank you very much for having the Divining, D Designing podcast. I have to say that twice, won't I? Thank you so much for having the Designing podcast and helping people, you know, giving a window into our world. I, I, I'm I, truly grateful for for you and Marilyn and uh, that, that this is even happening and that we have a platform now where we can sort of let people behind the curtain and um, and encourage another generation if they're passionate to, to do what we do. Cause... Yeah, and I mean, also we've got with Instagram, you know, people are, I think people are much more maybe aware of fashion. I mean, people have always mm -hmm. been, but now the fact that people can share fashion yeah. and share looks and, and, and that's become a real big part of social media, which I think is fantastic. Well, yeah. Are you on social media? Do you have a social media? I am, I am. I'm C A T E dot A D A I R on on Instagram, and okay. I, I go through waves of it. I keep being told by um, some of my my younger crew members that I need to do them on Friday on on Sunday, and then they can just post. And I, so I go through waves depending on um, how busy I am. Um, again, I I tend to go down a rabbit hole, and um, and just think about the, the work and my actors and and uh, forget about it. But I am on and I know that you are on and I will happily repost um, repost this. Oh, yeah. Um, and, we'll put it out um, there in a couple of weeks. It'll be up. Yeah. And if, if, if people have questions for me, they can certainly, you know, I do get questions through Instagram and I try very hard to, it takes me a minute sometimes, but I try very hard to answer them. Um, because you never know. I do have one question, I mean, one story for you, which doesn't need to be in the podcast, but to your point speaks to, um, speaks to sometimes 
unexpected turns that our work takes. And that is, I designed the, the first pilot of Babylon 5. You know, it's funny. I forgot to ask you about that. No, no, it's okay. No, that's not why I'm telling you the story. Um, I was down at Comic-Con simply on a general panel about costume design because somebody had fallen out and they sort of called me. I'm, I'm sort of like the person who fills the seats at the Oscars. That was called um, the, the Gathering, wasn't it? That pilot was called. It was indeed. Yeah. And again, I sort of took that over. Um, a, they'd hired somebody else and they, it wasn't working. So I, I took that whenever I think about five, five weeks before we started filming and we had to design and make it all in that time. So it's years later. This is... This isn't the same Comic Con with all of this. No, 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 right. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's one, maybe one or two before that. So it's not that long ago. And you know, there's the big hall where you can sign autographs afterwards uh -huh. and answer people's questions. The sale pavilion. That's it. Yeah. Yes. So towards the very end of the group, this rather, this very sweet, rather shy person comes uh, over and says, you know, Ms. Adair, and I said, oh, please call me Kate. They said, I just want to thank you. I said, thank you for what? Apparently they were a person, um, and they were, they were older. Um, they had seen the gathering at a point in their lives where they were very unsure of their identity and if you remember in the gathering there is one of the characters who during the course of the five years uh changes their um identity and also their gender in order to keep their species alive well kate this has been so much fun um thank you thank you for your time and i very much appreciate you being here Thank you very, very much for having me. And a very special thanks to our sponsor, International Silks and Woolens. ISW has what you need. Over 14,000 square feet of fabrics, notions, and drapery. Their large selection of over 100,000 fabrics includes theatrical, woolens, notions, bridal, cotton, drapery, and designer. ISW is eminent for the theatrical department, which is considered to be the largest in the United States. Whether you're looking for the perfect material for a special occasion, or vintage material for a big budget Hollywood movie, you will find it here at International Silks and Woolens. A special thank you to founder and executive producer, Martika Ibarra, co-founder, costume designer, the legendary Marilyn Vance, and of course, John Campia from The John Campia Show. Thank you to all of our viewers for tuning in and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, tune into the audio version wherever you listen to podcasts. I am, of course, your host, Robert Meyer Burnett, and you can find me on Instagram at RM Burnett or find me on Twitter at Burnett RM or on YouTube at Post Geek Singularity. Thanks very much. Like, subscribe, and give us your comments. What would you like to see on the channel? Right down below. Thanks very much for watching, and we'll see you on the next episode of Designing Hollywood.